Welcome back to another one of your flip lectures. Today we're going to talk about changes in domestic policy as well as cultural conflicts from 1964 to 1990. And so to kind of start off, I want to talk a little bit about how domestic policy or government policy in America is going to change. So the president in uh, the middle 60s, Lyndon Baines Johnson, his hero was Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And so he set out with an ambitious plan called the Great Society that was meant to build on the idea of the New Deal. He called this list of programs a war on poverty. And they included programs that we know today, like Medicare, uh, SNAP, which is food stamps. But all of these programs, though aimed at ending poverty in America, also caused the federal government to become larger, more expensive, and much, much more powerful. This also began to uh, create this sense that the government was focusing mostly on minorities, um, even though many of these uh, kind of war on poverty programs actually went uh, to white Americans. But the 1960s is going to kind of really involve an era of change. And much like kind of eras of change before it, there's an increased debate over what are these American values. And so there are social protests like we saw in the 1920s, like we saw in the progressive era that are going to try to lead to changes. Um, the anti-Vietnam War movement is going to grow very large. A counterculture kind of arises uh, in rejection of the values of post-war America, and there's going to be more government programs aimed, like in the progressive movement, at solving problems. But like we looked at with the Forgotten American, there was a reaction from the working and middle class. There's a resentment growing towards those receiving government age and a fundamental belief that the American way of life, American values, were being challenged in unacceptable ways. And so this shows up in a number of places, civil rights movements, the counterculture, the Vietnam War, great society, um, as well as kind of this forgotten American fighting, up, fighting against some of these different ideas about civil rights. So the counterculture, or who we commonly call the hippies, um, they set themselves up as counter to traditional values and authority. Now, very important about this, they are a very small number of young people, mostly from the middle and upper class. Uh, the vast majority of Americans are simply working, having families, going to churches, and actually the hippies are extraordinarily unpopular in most of American society. Um, their ethos of, of self, doing your own thing, living your own lifestyle, kind of led to a drug, sexual liberation, radical politics, and kind of the sense that everything was almost changing. In a lot of ways, this counterculture can kind of be connected to the counterculture of the 1920s, as well as kind of the reaction against it. Um, a lot of people also took up the cause of the Vietnam War. And a large anti-war movement began in 1964 and grew and build, built up until the 1970s where the Vietnam War is going to end. Um, Students for Democratic Society focused on organizing college students. Vietnam Veterans Against the War organized vets. Um, opposition to the draft actually led to the 26th Amendment passing, which lowered the voting age to 18 from 21. And so protests are going to also turn violent. The 68 Democratic National Convention in Chicago turns into an all-out street battle. And one anti-war group, the Weather Underground, begins a campaign of violence and bombings on American soil. And so this is a time where a lot of things seem to be changing very rapidly, and anything almost seems possible. In Chicago in 1968, um, the Democratic National Convention to nominate a presidential candidate takes place in the city. What ends up happening is protesters turn out and they end up in street fights with the Chicago police. And to a lot of Americans, this is kind of the unruly youth going up against the authority. And so it's a very divisive moment, but very kind of um, representative of the conflicts that are happening in the 1960s. We also looked at the civil rights movements, and so those nonviolent protests against Vietnam are going to turn radical, where we have groups like the Black Panthers and the Brown Berets um, are going to oppose the Vietnam War. Uh, even boxer Muhammad Ali is going to refuse to be drafted. So the Vietnam War is also going to be cast in terms of the civil rights movement, which leads us to the Great Silent Majority. And so the Great Silent Majority, as you can see from the sign in the back, that character is your qualification. The idea that most Americans are not involved in radical politics, most Americans are not involved in the counterculture, most Americans want a, to continue traditional American values. 
And so this forgotten American idea uh, is going to be a reaction against the Great Society, against the radicalization of civil rights movements, against the radicalization of Vietnam War protesters. And so in large numbers, white middle class work, sorry, white working class workers are going to leave the New Deal coalition under Roosevelt and are going to leave the Democratic Party and start to move towards a more conservative Re Republican Party that speaks to what they believe is their interests. And so this all culminates um, in several political campaigns, but it is a very old old script that was also used by our current president, Donald Trump. And so Richard Nixon is elected on this platform of the Great Silent Majority, and he sets out to restore traditional America. So ultimately, what we end up with uh, is a divided states of America that really is still playing out today. You have traditional values um, versus kind of these new changing attitudes about relationships, gender, race. You have radical anti-war protesters versus those that might oppose the Vietnam War, but still do not want violence in their streets and want the police to maintain law and order. There is also this culture war between the hippies and the youth and the working class that feels like they're um, kind of privileged and throwing away um, their kind of American birthrights. There's also going to become increased controversy over welfare programs, over middle class workers versus those receiving benefits. And of course, race is going to become tied into all of this. And so even though civil rights means that legally kind of race is going to become less of an issue, it is going to be tied into conflicts now over government programs and a resentment as at a perceived preference for minority workers. In a lot of ways, um, kind of this racism is going to play out throughout the 70s, 80s, 90s, and arguably into today. And so all these divisions are really going to shape our politics by polarizing it, pushing people kind of more towards the left and more towards the right. And so uh, the person that's going to represent that resurgence of conservatism is going to be this character of Ronald Reagan. Um, this is also a time where Americans are struggling with identity. What does it mean to be an American? What are American values? And so these value systems present fundamentally different visions of the country. The role and size of the government, social issues like abortion, marriage, religion, uh, the place of minorities in society. And so in a lot of ways, the way that we fractured, we are still fractured today. Um, and so this fracture is also going to be dealt a blow um, with the Watergate scandal. So oftentimes, kind of today, we are very cynical about our politicians, though we used to be a lot more trusting. But Watergate is going to be kind of one of these black marks on the presidency that is never really going to heal. But what the Watergate scandal actually was, um, was during the 1972 election, when Nixon's re-election campaign was underway, uh, five Nixon supporters broke into the Watergate Hotel, which was also the Democratic Party headquarters, to steal documents, tap their phones. But these people were kind of foolish, they were stupid, and so they got caught very quickly. And they were linked to the Nixon campaign. At first, Nixon denied any involvement because he said that he didn't know anything. So the story dies down for a while. But a couple of investigative reporters from the Washington Post, Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein, are going to uncover more and more of this scandal, and it's going to launch a government investigation into seeing whether or not the president was involved in a burglary and phone tapping of his political opponents. Which leads us to this very important thing, the Nixon tapes. And so Richard Nixon, it turned out, recorded almost every conversation that he had in the White House on tape. Investigators from the Congress obviously wanted to see those tapes in order to prove what Nixon knew or didn't know about Watergate and when he knew it. But Nixon claimed something called executive privilege, saying that he did not have to hand over his tapes to law enforcement, the Supreme Court, or Congress because all White House conversations are confidential because he is the president. However, the Supreme Court did weigh in on this and said that the only things a president does not have to produce as evidence would be things that dealt with national security. And so it's a very important precedent as we talk about presidential power today that the president is not above the law. But once the tapes come out, um, it ends up being revealed that Nixon knew not about the break-in, but about the cover-up. And so because he knew about the cover-up, impeachment is going to happen in April of 1974. He's going to be formally charged and is going to stand trial in the Senate. And so rather than have uh, the country play, play that out, on August 9th, 1974, Nixon resigns, citing the fact that America needs a full-time president. And so Richard Nixon becomes the first president in our history to resign the presidency, and his vice president, Gerald Ford, would take over at a very uncertain time in American history. But ultimately, the impact of Watergate is big. And that's why I like this political cartoon. 
it really represents kind of a loss of faith in the presidency and government, kind of a rise of distrust of our leaders and cynicism about the offices in which they hold. But this also brought about a series of new laws, campaign reform, procedures for investigating government officials. And so as we look at Watergate, we use it to kind of talk about every single scandal where almost everything is a something gate these days, going back to kind of this original big scandal. Well, other things are happening in uh, this era as well. Uh, in 1973, the Supreme Court ruled in Roe v. Wade that the Constitution protects uh, a woman's right to seek uh, an abortion. Well, what this kicks off, as uh, you guys well know, is one of the biggest cultural fights that we're going to have in our country's history. It's going to play out from the 70s up until now, and if you read the newspaper, it is still playing out every day. So again, it is a clash of values, it is a clash of cultures, it is a clash of kind of what we believe about the United States. Some other issues that have become very, very prevalent, pollution and smog. Um, kind of 70 years after industrialization, this is the smog over New York City. You can see that in the background, you can barely see its skyline, so this becomes a major, major issue. And so once it becomes an issue, um, it becomes an issue in culture. Silent Spring by Rachel Carson basically is going to put out this idea that we could potentially ruin kind of life in our habitat and the planet. Uh, Dr. Seuss's The Lorax challenges people to kind of use less and recycle and like not waste the earth. And so all this kind of is going to culminate in the 1970s with the passage of the Clean Air and Water Act and the creation of the Environmental Protection Agency. Today, as we face issues of climate change, we are still debating these ideas about our economy and our environment and the world in which we all have to live. So as far as popular culture goes, the 1970s are going to be characterized by something called the me decade. And so the me decade is going to be this search for self-fulfillment, kind of narcissism, that a lot of people are going to say was a result of the failure of the political movements of the 1960s. A lot of large political movements happen in the 1960s. For a lot of people, change doesn't come rapidly enough or change doesn't come at all. And so because of that, people are going to feel lost, confused, and they're going to turn to self-help in order for them to try to find a way forward. With scandals, economic crises, Vietnam, uh, gas rationing, Americans want to look inward as opposed to outward. And so a new age movement starts with new religions being created, self-help seminars, therapy becomes more, much more widespread as Americans turn from kind of the social activism of the 60s to kind of the internal focus of the 70s. But a couple other large things are going to happen um, in the media. Uh, Mary Tyler Moore becomes the first unmarried professional woman to be on television, and so she's going to normalize that for a generation of Americans. All in the Family features a, features a two-generational American household where the dad, Archie Bunker, is kind of this old racist who learns throughout the course of the show that really, like, his thoughts just come from ignorance and not from anything else. And so in the 70s, like, some issues are coming up. They're starting to be dealt with. Uh, the Jeffersons in Good Times, for the first time you see whole black families on TV, not just as supporting characters, but as the main characters. And so this is a large step forward when we talk about civil rights and culture. Um, also, too, like the disco era, kind of very, very uh, representative of the 1970s. It's about me dancing in my fancy clothes, it's fun, it's superficial, and that kind of is the ethos of the 70s. Um, a lot of people have made comparisons to the me decade of then, to the me decade of today. And so every new generation, guys, gets a label. And so I'm not sure whatever that label is going to mean for you. And so ultimately, guys, the 70s is going to set up for more major changes. Americans are going to turn to a new president. Divisions are going to deepen. And the me decade is going to turn into a decade of indulgence. So we talk about ideology in the United States today, we talk about primarily two ideas, liberalism and conservatism. Um, in general, conservatism preaches limited government, preaches kind of free enterprise, as well as this idea of keeping um, traditional American values. Liberalism, more active government. Government should not be putting a ban on social behavior, should not be you know, setting culture. And so basically these two ideas are set up, they view the world extraordinarily differently. And so liberalism had dominated the 20th century. The New Deal, the Great Society, uh, government regulations, economic welfare programs are going to expand the government tremendously. So by the 1980s, conservatism is making a comeback. In the context of the Cold War, the Great Society seems a little socialist, collecting taxes and then redistributing them. 
Uh, regional differences are also going to play out big, where the Northeast, uh, kind of the bastion of liberalism, is going to be losing out to the growing South and the growing West. Um, suburbs are going to be angry over high taxes and inflation that they blame on liberal policies. And religious Americans are going to turn to conservatives to retain those traditional values uh, that they believe make America great. And so when Ronald Reagan is elected in 1980, they call it the Reagan Revolution. It's the first time that a Republicans won the Senate. Um, it was the first, it was the um, kind of modern Republican president, as well as the most conservative president probably ever elected. So he wins big in 1980. Um, Jimmy Carter had been weakened extraordinarily by the Iran hostage crisis, the OPEC embargo, and others. And so Reagan comes in with a brand new solution where he says, in this present crisis, government is not the solution to our problem. Government is the problem. And so he called for Americans to solve their problems themselves, and he asked the government to take a much kind of smaller role. Um, and so his economic plan was Reaganomics. Essentially, uh, the idea was to raise interest rates, to lower the amount of money borrowed, so that inflation would go down. He also wanted to lower taxes on investors and businesses, believing that if investors had more money, they would invest more, and that increased wealth would create more jobs, create less poverty. Um, we usually call this trickle-down economics because you give tax cuts to those at the top, and then the benefits, in theory, are going to trickle down to the workers. But this represents a major, major change. And so the budget battles between Reagan and the Democratic House, uh, led by Tip O'Neill, are going to be big. Um, Reagan's going to negotiate a 25% tax cut, which is really big. But less taxes means less revenue, which means that they have to cut spending for social programs that a lot of people are going to attribute to some of the crime issues of the 80s and the 90s. Um, they also try to balance the budget, but ultimately Reagan's military spending to end the Cold War is really going to destroy his budget, and the government's actually going to run big deficits under Reagan's small government presidency. Um, so the Reagan economy is a really interesting economy. One, one because it is going to lead to an epic uh, economic expansion where unemployment's going to fall, incomes rise by 15%, but what this is characterized by uh, is an unequal growth. Um, prosperity is going to go more to the people at the top, and those at the very bottom are not going to see their boats lifted. Uh, also, too, businesses are going to be um, less regulated. They're going to get rid of a lot of rules, um, such as price controls, um, more public land available for drilling and mining, as well as kind of those reduced environmental regulations. And so for businesses, this is seen as a positive, but for environmentalists, they see this as a major step backwards. Um, so Reagan also got to put four people on the Supreme Court in his eight years in time. And so he shaped the Supreme Court in a big way, um, including the first woman to ever be on the court, Sandra Day O'Connor, who served um, for a long time. He also put on the court William Rehnquist, Antonin Scalia, and Anthony Kennedy, two of which are still on the court today. But the culture of the 1980s is kind of interesting. Um, it's, a, it's a culture that celebrates kind of indulgence, wealth, status symbols, um, kind of like the way that we looked at the industrial era, um, kind of that era of you know monkey parties and dollar bills and horseback and everything. And so status symbols become increasingly important um, in this time. Cars, clothes, watches, you know, like designer, everything. And so they're called young urban professionals or the yuppies. And so this on one hand is what's happening in the upper class. In the lower class, um, you have kind of a, an emerging hip hop culture in the urban cities um, that is going to kind of come up as a counter to this yuppie idea. Um, but all, a lot of new technology in the 70s and 80s are also going to kind of change our lives. The Sony Walkman, the VCR, cable and satellite television, as well as the first video games are all going to lead to the personalization of leisure time and entertainment. Where previously you would go out more and do more social activities in order to kind of be entertained, more and more your music, your video, your channel, your game is personalized for you. And so Americans begin to participate less in kind of group entertainment. The invention of MTV kind of is a great example of uh, this idea of cable, of targeting certain demographics, the first video games. And so what this does is it connects us more to ourselves and connects us to our technology, but it connects to each other less. Um, in the 1980s, in television and film, um, the decadence really shows up. The most popular show is Dallas. It's about unscrupulous oil barons. But you also have The Cosby Show. 
And uh, regardless of uh, Bill Cosby, it's a very, very significant show. It's America's most popular sitcom, and it features a black family. And so in a lot of ways, people looked at The Cosby Show as kind of a major step forward for race in America in the 1980s. However, the 1980s weren't all they were cracked up to be. Um, although we look at this time uh, through you know, economics and it seems kind of very good, it was actually a time of incredible poverty in a lot of places. Um, drug abuse and alcohol abuse are going to rise incredibly in the 1980s, leading to the drinking age itself being raised to 21. Um, there was a Just Say No campaign launched against drug abuse, and there was a major, especially crack ep epidemic in American cities. Um, this here is a subway in New York City. You can kind of see all the people that are sleeping there. And so there's a massive crime wave in the 80s that people think is really going to like jeopardize the future of the country. Uh, there's an AIDS, there is an AIDS epidemic that breaks out across the country, and the government's largely going to ignore it. Homelessness is going to rise to levels that had not been seen before, like the Great Depression. And so all of this stuff means that there really is kind of a flip side to the prosperity of the Reagan era. And so Americans are encouraged to just say no to drugs as drug violence becomes an increasingly fixture in the cities. The crack epidemic swept across America, um, jeopardizing lives, ruining families. Um, the, AIDS, the AIDS epidemic came up uh, in the 1980s as well, where you have whole communities that are being affected in large ways. And so a lot of people in the 80s also, they want the government to step in, they want to do research, but instead this kind of becomes a hysterical thing where people thought that basically you could get AIDS from anywhere by anything, and particularly um, being targeted was the homosexual community, saying that it was basically a gay disease, even though there was no kind of you know science supporting that. And so actually the AIDS memorial quilt in 1987 was made kind of in a tragic way because the people that contributed a quilt square wanted to do it so that history would not forget these people. Their fear was that those affected by the AIDS, AIDS epidemic would be swept under the rug because of who they were. And so the AIDS memorial quilt, kind of a very kind of interesting thing where people are trying again to change American society the way that they have been this entire time. And so ultimately where we are at today is this. We have unresolved issues from the last six decades. Our fear of the Cold War in many ways has morphed into the fear of terrorism. We developed a society based on consumption, wealth, and technology that becomes increasingly individualized, and we are dealing with the fallout of that today. But we also are still dealing with a very intense conflict amongst Americans about these issues we've been talking about all year. Civil rights and race, gender and sexual orientation, role of government and welfare, American values, uh, the wealth versus the poverty. And so ultimately, where we are at is this is an unfinished story where we are still struggling today to reconcile these arguments that we've been having since 1776.